And now the owner of My Amazon Guy, here's Stephen Pope. Sales. Yeah. Now, if you break that out, 15% goes to the referral fee. And then the remainder of it, I usually suggest seven to 10% on ad spend. 10 is my general recommendation. And then yeah. that gets us to 25. And then between the 25 and 33, that seven, eight percent generally comes from logistics. So what I count in that is going from your warehouse into Amazon, going mm -hmm. out of Amazon's warehouse to the consumer, rolling up returns in that and rolling up FBA fees as well. So like a Very pick, pack and ship, for example, for a small item like this, I've got some cinnamon in my hand right here, uh, usually runs about $3.50. Now, if you go over that 12 inches and you're, you're selling this Windex item, you're now slightly oversized uh, and ran out of stuff on my desk. Go figure. Uh, so, but you get oversized and then your fees go up exponentially. You might be more like five or six bucks. So uh, once you understand that, that they're going to be a 33% part of your partner, you can then understand like what items become more attractive, what business models become more attractive. And I would say that uh, there is a really good measure is to stay above a $15 price point like 100% of the time and ideally $20 price points where you want to be minimum. Uh, so when you look at acquiring businesses, if they, you know, if it's in grocery, you're not going to be in that high enough ticket item. Your margins are going to be weak and you need to keep that in mind when you make your offer. If you're going to be in supplements, your margins will be high, but your complications and complexities and competition will be stiffer than any other category. Yeah. So if you subscribe to me, uh, you will hear me hit on supplements frequently. It's my least favorite category. Um, hackers showing up with random keywords like heroin on a listing that that's for you in the U S but they do the hack in the United kingdom and it takes down your U S listing kind of bull crap. So high risk category. So if you're coming in this, uh, and, and you're trying to figure out like what category to start with. My recommendation is do what you know. Yeah. If you can't do what you know, stick to home and goods. Home and goods is plenty of room to expand in um, and plenty of room to grow into. Gift items, while seasonal, also very, very solid. And, and, I, and I know a lot about that category. Okay. Um, so, so things like clothing is down 37%. Things like uh, beauty also down about 30%. Those will probably bound back travel, obviously down today, but the moment it's back, it's probably going to be like a 500% spike from compared to a year ago. Right? So if you want to get ahead of time and you want to ride that wave, you could go buy a travel company on the, on the Fritz right now and turn it around, knowing that you're going to, going to kill it in a year or two from now. So depending on your, uh, your risk tolerance, that would guide what business to go acquire. So, so there's two types of products. There's demand gen, and then there are co-opting demand products. Yeah. I recommend, especially on your first account, go for a co-opt demand. Yeah, that's what I did. Uh, now, if, if you're uh, product smarts and engineering smarts, you, know, you can go to market with a new product nobody's ever heard of. That's cool. As long as you pair with a good marketer, uh, you might be okay. But, but generally speaking, the failure rate is like 90% on demand gen versus co-opt way, way higher um, success rates. Uh, and, and for every three products you launch from scratch, so this is not an acquisition question, this is more of a, a, a product starting metric. Every three products you launch, one will, I guarantee will fail and lose money. The second will break even, and the third is the money maker. And, and so that's an acceptable ratio. Okay. That's why I, I, I call it the rule of three. Uh, I recommend launching uh, in a rule of three whenever possible. And by the way, that's not three colors of the same product. That's yeah. three unique products. Need sales to get sales. Yeah. So the example that you shared with Facebook to an e-com website, that mantra would not apply yeah. because uh, you live and die by the paid click ad, so to speak. Like you're targeting an audience targeting and your creative would have more impact than anything else. Additionally, Amazon has solved friction and anxiety for you already. So what do I mean by that? Yeah. Um, no, you don't have to convince somebody to give them your credit. You're, you give you their credit card number. They're already trusting Amazon, right? 
it's half the economy and whatnot. And then from a friction standpoint, uh, the checkout button and all, all of those procedural things that a website might have a challenge with, page speed, load time, huge one with conversion rates, et cetera, all of that is also solved. So, so with that in mind on Amazon, instead of solving those friction areas or those anxiety areas, it's more about having uh, the ability to generate sales. Amazon then rewards those sales by ranking your product you just have to co-opt that demand and, and those people that are already looking for the product on the platform. Uh, the product life cycle, uh, I, have, I have mixed feelings on this topic right now. Uh, it, it feels shorter on Amazon than it does off of Amazon in some ways, but in uh, the counter to that is it's really hard to dethrone a product with a thousand reviews, right? Yeah. So, so there's, there's kind of uh, two schools of thought you could look at in that regard. Uh, I would value a review. This is an interesting tidbit. I would value each review at somewhere around $15. So if you go to make an acquisition of a company and they have, you know, a thousand reviews, yes, I would value that at about $15,000 is safe to predict in that category in general, right? So like pay-per-click advertising still averaging 80 cents a click in that category at large, whereas supplements is four bucks, beauty is $4, tech is $4 on average per click. So if you're selling a $20 item, you don't convert the 33% of them, you're already at a loss. Um, so a lot of companies will advertise products at a, at a loss when they launch. They'll give away hundreds, if not a couple thousand products when they first launch. Now, that's not necessary to succeed on Amazon, but it definitely accelerates your success by a long shot. So um, while we have done less on external traffic efforts because it's harder to track it's still it's probably the direction that you need to head um, you need to have a sophisticated external traffic strategy in place there's there's concepts called search find buy um, where you train the user to go find your product to train the algorithm to give you keyword credit i don't know if that'll still work by by next year it may not um, and and it's a moving target it's very very complex yeah. i have positioned my agency within seller central because it's what i can count on and we've just become 10 out of 10 on that I'm probably not a 10 out of 10 on external traffic. I just recognize its importance. But 4.1 is acceptable. Anything below that, then you know that the product probably has some challenges. Okay. Uh, and again, exceptions depending on the polarization of the product. <clears throat> but that's kind of a generalization. Uh, so there's a, a lot of different strategies where you can hang your hat is go find a good product. If you find a good product, the marketing can figure itself out. Okay. If you, if you do a me too product, right? So like if you do something that's made out of silicone and there's nothing you can do to differentiate that product versus the next guy, you're going to be competing with mom and pop guys with, with inventory coming out of Alibaba. And then they, they stick it in their, their garage, their closet, wherever, and they can beat you on price because they don't have operations. So, so find something that's high quality, um, that you can, you know, do that maybe not everybody can do and understand easily to manufacture. Um, a lot of time people will build kits where you're adding additional value. So I might sell a beer glass plus a beer uh, opener. That's a way harder to replicate product as an example. Also increases your complexity. And then you got to figure out how to package that without breaking the beer glass, which is, um, and I bring up that is a good case example because um, any, any problem that a seller would face could become a competitive advantage for you. And that's a good framework to adopt early on. Okay. Any problem. Yeah. Because by solving it now sets a higher bar. Correct. For everybody just to be a couple to come in and price match and listing match and try to take it away. We've seen more international sellers show up in the U S market than ever before. It's like a landslide of people coming right now. And so uh, they won't be able to solve cultural things. They won't be able to solve um, complex issues. Um, and so it, it just protects, protects your business by doing that. I also think that the, the trade war with China will impact a lot of people. Um, you may, you know, if, if, if you do business with uh, an acquisition and they've got uh, Vietnamese manufacturing, I would say that's a huge advantage right now. Um, also, if you can buy something that has... Um, uh, the capacity to manage uh, U.S. production, even at a higher premium. Um, by the way, I don't know how to solve that yet. That's just me prophesying. That's where things are heading. Um, yeah. 
I don't think you need to acquire a US based manufacturing plan or facility or whatnot. But if you do, I predict high success long term, not short term. And I use it to showcase examples. Um, the categories that you listed off are extremely broad. Uh, yes, they are. You, so you would have to. So what you could do is you could pick two or three items in each category. So, you know, you talked about mom and spa stuff. So gifts for mom, right? So if you were just to get, you know, search for that and see what typically comes up, ignore the sponsored ad results. Yeah. But, but if you were to uh, research that and see what comes up and just start seeing, okay, we got gag gifts coming up. We've got, we got glassware, things with sayings on it. Very, very common. Right. And then you even yep. just have random shoes and clothing show up. So a lot of things to think about, I would say stay away from cutting boards, uh, customization. If you have the ability to get some equipment and you, you understand how to, to, to do that cu customization is a, a, a very good model, but it's difficult to scale and time and labor intensive. Um, but also very, very viable. Um, so I, I would recommend trying to get something, uh, more generic for your first, if you can, but if you feel comfortable in the customization side, you could. Uh, so you talked about, so, so I would say, uh, spa and wax, you know, so like if we just looked at wax beads, for example, this category is gigantic, uh, just utterly gigantic. If we looked at the sales velocities, some of these companies are racking in 800,000, a million per month, um, on three to five SKUs. Wow. So there's a, there's a ton of opportunity there, but it's also very competitive and there's not a lot of differentiation between these things. Right. Like, so, yeah. so that's, that's an angle to look at. Um, the, the more niche of a product you go for the, the lower, perhaps the sales velocity, but the higher chance you will succeed. If that makes sense. I went to China a few years back. I bought a suitcase, uh, that was just kind of a rip off of one of the Swiss companies, totally solid suitcase. Um, bought it for a hundred bucks on the floor, which was nice. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure the rep I bought it from just pocketed it. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, the, the, I, I did an, I did a podcast interview yesterday with a guy who does inspections in China and he, he just on the front lines, the amount of fraud, bribery and whatnot's insane. Uh, the, the, the pay to play, uh, cultural aspect is just a very, very corrupt society over there right now. Um, speaking factually, unfortunately, absolutely. So, uh, and, and I, and I guess I'll del delineate between the HR company versus, uh, having, having, uh, the ability to, to, to rely upon partners. Um, I see those as two separate things. The, the partner aspect is more of, you know, you, there, there's, there's a, a, a team of, of partners and vendors and relationships that's not as much of an HR company versus you are directly hiring people and putting them on payroll and training them and investing in people long-term. See, those are two separate tracks. I wanted to differentiate that a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and being able to get inventory from location A to B. And then the third is marketing. Marketing is the easiest one to get correct, but is also the most sophisticated. So if, okay. so what do I mean by that? It's much harder to find a good product and operationally move it, right? Even if you're exceptional at that, it's still very, very difficult and you can't speed that process up. But on marketing, if, if you have a good product and you run the playbook, you're almost guaranteed success. Um, not the case on the other two channels. So, so with that in mind, I would recommend, um, you know, my unique questions I ask a, a business if I'm looking to acquire them would include, you know, hey, I think there's three things every company always needs to run. It's finance, operations, and marketing. Can you tell me which one that you feel like you're best at? And, and which one do you think the company has been weakest at? Just hear what they have to say. I think you'll find more from that question than you will almost anything else you can find in the brief. That's, that's a great question. So there are things you can see from the front of a listing. I just picked a random product here, by the way, right? So if you go to their image and for example, you saw their main image just wasn't appetizing or it wasn't cropped correctly. So for this is a good, good, well cropped photo um, because there's no white space in the top and the bottom. So in search results, it looks big. Yep. So if you find something like that, that's very easy for you to come in and like corrective action and, and fix that up. 
if you look at their parentage and you found it confusing, there's certain things that are in stock and out of stock. There's inventory constraint questions you'd want to ask them. And why didn't you clean up this catalog? That kind of stuff. You could look at the review counts and ask some basic questions like, you know, why are you at a 4.1 star? What do you think, you know, what would, what's preventing you from being a, a five-star product in your opinion? Um, and they might just say, well, that's, you know, just, just what Amazon customers do. And they may not have an articulated answer on that. You may not be able to action that particular question, but it's a good question to ask. Uh, have they filled out six, seven photos? Do they have a video made, which these guys do? Wow, let me try and stop that. Um, and what's interesting about this particular product, I just randomly checked. These guys have been live streaming, which is uh, a new thing with Amazon Live. And you need an iPhone to do that. And most people don't have iPhones. Um, so there's a lot of uh, things that this particular product's doing well. Obviously, they have exceptional products. They're number one in toiletry bags. Like, we're not going to knock these guys off, and nor are they probably going to sell. Uh, but if you look down their list, did they fill out their bullet points? Are they articulated? Um, is it clear and easy to understand the product value proposition? So they have a medium versus large because they probably, number one feedback they probably got was this item's too small. But, and this is yep. the kind of thing like they sell into the objections. So is there a way for you to make improvements on that? Um, if we look at the history of an item, so we, if we look at, uh, well, all time data, really hard to read that there. But if we look at 90, 90 days, we can see that um, a lower BSR, so sales rank of 500 is very exceptional. Um, is there any times when it went, you know, when it went to 50,000 BSR? Well, if it did, that means it went out of stock. Hey, um, seller, why did, why did your item go out of stock? Walk me through that. And they'll be like, well, COVID. Or, uh, you know, we had a spike in demand or whatever it might be. So I recommend financing a year of inventory ahead of time going into next year. Um, most companies are not doing that. Uh, and pe people will say, oh, I would never do that. Just in time supply chain management's where it's at. And I, I think just in, just in time supply chain management is dead personally. Um, and you can see, you can see how everybody doesn't know how to navigate these black swan events, highly unpredictable, improbable events, yep. COVID or fire, you know, wildfires or whatever hurricane it might be, um, or trade war. So that's why I'm saying like, control your own destiny, control as much as you can. It's worth the expense in my opinion. So you can look at the BSR and see like, okay, you can see price fluctuation. So if, let's say this was a year, year long item and we saw price started out at 27 and then a year ago went down to 25 and three months ago went down to 20. You would immediately know that they have competition pressure. Intellectual property. This is a good, good talking point. So if a company doesn't have a trademark, they, they don't understand Amazon. Like that, that is a just bar none. If they don't have a trademark, then you know, from, from that question alone, they do not have the wear wall or understanding how to sell on Amazon, just blatantly period. Like you will know if they don't have a trademark, they're not running ads correctly. They're not doing anything correct. That's an easy, easy knowledge gain. Now that doesn't prevent you from buying them, by the way. Yeah. I bring, I bring this up as a point of, of suggesting uh, how, how that might work. Um, so it's much easier to file a trademark today than it ever has been. Um, I have some, did we, I don't remember if we talked about trademarks yesterday or not, did we? We didn't. No. Nope. Okay. So, so as homework for you, I would recommend that you come in and read everything on this trademark page um, and just understand yeah. it a little bit. It's worth yeah. 20 or 30 minutes of your time. There's a 20 minute video on the comprehensive guide to brand registry and trademarks. Um, watch it. it. It'll tell you why this is an important question. A plus content, um, advertising features, analytics, you name it, all good stuff. So, so yep. I'll sidestep that because that's not worth your coaching time, but it's, but it's very beneficial to understand like why that's an easy question to figure out. And then once you, so let's assume that they don't have a trademark, you would buy them and immediately file one. And then you could yep. get access to brand registry in less than a week. This couldn't have happened 30 days ago. This is brand spanking new. So if we were having this coaching call a month ago, I would have said, don't buy a brand without a trademark because it takes six months to go through Today, it's no longer a problem, but you can articulate it and be like, well, you don't have any intellectual properties, so I think your evidence should be X lower. Because of that, you can use a negotiating tactic instead. So here's, here's an, another rule of three for you. For every PPC sell you get, it generates three organic. Okay. So back to that weird mantra where I said you need sales to get sales. Yeah. That's part of it. So if you generate higher velocities, Amazon will reward you. So if we look at the keyword rankings of this listing... I'm going to guess this thing's going to be ranked for like six, 7,000 keywords. Cause this, this is like a top product on Amazon An average product will rank for like 1200. 
if you run, run this tool on one of the companies you're looking to buy and it comes in at like 500, you would know they haven't invested in SEO or done it correctly. So this, okay. this one came in at 7,200 and they're advertising on 4,000 keywords. This is a, a, a normal ratio, exactly kind of what I expect for, for a product at that caliber. Um, and then you can see that if you look at the top 50 keywords, they're in slot one on all 50. If you looked at one of the companies you were looking to buy, and that's on the far right here in the organic side right there. Um, but if you looked at a company and they had like five keywords in the top 10, and then they had like, you know, started going to rank 30 by slot 10, um, then you would know that they're in their infancy or they're relying yeah. upon PPC or they're relying upon their brand recognition from some external factor that's not necessarily related to Amazon. Yeah. There, there's, there's a lot of different advantages that you could gain by making that acquisition, right? So you already have manufacturing in place, supply already here. It accelerates your, your plan by six to 12 months minimum. Um, so because it takes six months to get something manufactured in life. Uh, so there's, there's a speed value. Uh, there's also, they, they did something right to get where they are today, but they've also done four things wrong. So if you could correct two or three of those four things and do so in the first 60, 90 days, then you could accelerate their growth and maybe double or triple them in a very short time period. Um, so one of the questions you have to figure out is like, okay, how long has the company been around, right? So a lot of the times when companies um, are, are being acquired, they like to see two to three years of, of data. Um, so if the company is younger than that, which is very common right now on Amazon, then you have more risk and volatility and you might be able to command a lower EBITDA, but you also have more risk by default. Right. So if they were able to do this in a short time period and go from zero to something, then why couldn't you do that on your own or the next 10 guys on their own? So you need, you, you need to understand what they were exceptional at. So uh, in my opinion, companies need to do th three things to succeed. Um, and this is super broad. This is specific to Amazon, but, I, but I'll give you my take on it. Um, they need to have good finance. So you got to keep the got to have money in the bank. And this is probably the one that most people fail at, to be, to be yeah. honest. Okay. It was me, the first take too. It was it was about being too timid and being too reliant on quick winners, which is not FBA, right? And then the second is operations. And when I talk about operations, I primarily mean inventory um, and, and being able to get inventory from location A to B. And then the third is marketing. Marketing is the easiest one to get correct, but is also the most sophisticated. So if... Okay. So what do I mean by that? It's much harder to find a good product and operationally move it, right? Even if you're exceptional at that, it's still very, very difficult and you can't speed that process up. But on marketing, if, if you have a good product and you run the playbook, you're almost guaranteed success. Um, not the case on the other two channels. So, so with that in mind, I would recommend, um, you know, my unique questions I ask a, a business if I'm looking to acquire them would include, you know, hey, I think there's three things every company always needs to run. It's finance, operations, and marketing. Can you tell me which one that you feel like you're best at? And, and which one do you think the company's been weakest at? Just hear what they have to say. I think you'll find more from that question than you will almost anything else you can find in the brief or at yeah. large. Whereas supplements is four bucks, beauty is $4, tech is $4 on average per click. So if you're selling a $20 item, you don't convert the 33% of them, you've already had a loss. Um, so a lot of companies will advertise products at a lot at a loss when they launch, they'll give away hundreds, if not a couple thousand products when they first launch. Now that's not necessary to succeed on Amazon, but it definitely accelerates your success by a long shot. So, um, while we have done less on external traffic efforts because it's harder to track, it's still, it's probably the direction that you need to head. Um, you need to have a sophisticated external traffic strategy in place. There's, there's concepts called search, find, buy, um, where you train the user to go find your product, to train the algorithm, to give you keyword credit. I don't know if that'll still work by, by next year. It may not. Um, and, and it's a moving target. It's very, very complex. Yeah. I have positioned my agency within Seller Central because it's what I can count on. And we've just become 10 out of 10 on that. I'm probably not a 10 out of 10 on external traffic. I just recognize its importance. Yeah. And, and so does everybody else. Therefore those flip within 24 hours. So, so that's, that's going to be the challenge. So, 
uh, going down that discovery path may be, you know, worthwhile. So for me personally, like I'm, I think I'm a unique individual and my needs are different than the averages when it comes to life and business in general. Um, but specifically on the house hunt, I need to see 20 houses before I know what I want. Yeah. That's a pretty high amount, by the way, <laughs> yeah. drives realtors crazy. Uh, and so, but once, once I've seen 20, I know what the market looks like and I know what the price I'm willing to pay is and I know to do it. I don't know what that equivalent is for acquiring a business. But what I would say to you is you probably need to go down discovery with three to understand it at minimum. Um, the biggest conundrum that you're going to find as you start this, right? So let's say you invest 300K to go buy a company. Well, 300K was the starting point. It wasn't the end point, right? Like you moved into the house, but then you get in there and you're like, well, I guess we got to build a retaining wall. And I, there was a flood here three years ago and now we got to rebuild the basement. And um, well, this kitchen hasn't been redone in 10 years and the wife wants it. So like that, so whatever you invest, imagine another 25% needs to be in cash available. Yeah. That might be conservative. I might even go 50%. Um, so, and, and 25% of that 50% probably needs to be on product expansion. And, and then the remainder is just fixing the company up and, and building resources. So, uh, because if you, if you buy a company and you don't immediately just start expanding their products, you, I think you're missing out. Um, and, and you should be launching products every year consistently. Um, I, I have a lot of experience in the lighting industry and I went to uh, a lot of lighting markets and they have two markets, one in January, one in June. And January is always the biggest one where they released on average, like small brands re released like 300 SKUs and big brands released like 3000 SKUs. <laughs> And, and so they, that's what they did. And they go to market and every, all the buyers show up and whatever. Um, so on Amazon, there isn't a, a set time frame of when you have to go to market. The most ideal time to launch a product though, is ironically Q4. It's harder to do, but if you do it successfully and you launch in September or November, somewhere in that time range, you, you will do really, really well, believe it or not even without the reviews competing against the big boys. It's just the conversion rates are higher, the traffic's higher, and you can take advantage of it. So, so in any case, if you go acquire a company by March and you, you go in there and you're like, okay, I'm going to spend 50 grand fixing this, 20 grand fixing that, and five grand fixing this, and then I'm also going to set another side, another 30 grand to go build the next three products and then have each of those flows just push them out and immediately go execute. It's easier to fix marketing, yeah. much easier and, and quicker. Um, and so one of the other points I, I, I want to articulate too, is you only need to be exceptional at one of those three things to run an okay company. I would, I would treat the acquisition of a business eerily similar to the acquisition of a house. I think that those two markets are very eerily similar. So, uh, when you walk into a house and you know, it's the one, you know, it within the first two minutes and, and so does everybody else. Therefore those flip within 24 hours. So, so that's, that's going to be the challenge. So uh, going down that discovery path may be, you know, worthwhile. So for me personally, like I'm, I think I'm a unique individual and my needs are different than the averages when it comes to life and business in general. Um, but specifically on the house hunt, I need to see 20 houses before I know what I want. Yeah. That's a pretty high amount, by the way, <laughs> yeah. drives realtors crazy. Uh, and so, but once, once I've seen 20, I know what the market looks like and I know what the price I'm willing to pay is and I know to do it. I don't know what that equivalent is for acquiring a business. It's well, easier I mean, to fix marketing, yeah. much easier and, and quicker. Um, and so one of the other points I, I want to articulate too is you only need to be exceptional at one of those three things to run an okay company. Yeah. As long as you get like a, a B, B minus on the other two, if you get an A on one of those three, you have a strong company. And, and so generally speaking of my 150 clients, the ones that are doing well that come to us, they usually have an A in operations most of the time. Um, and, and finance, it's harder for me to gauge. Uh, but I would say, uh, generally speaking, the clients that end up failing the most, it's usually because the finance is the issue. The difference of the financing between the two worlds, though, is uh, the, 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 the amount of, of quantity you're ordering in those chunks for those items. Uh, so, so that's one philosophy we could go into, uh, the, the building aspect is, is a lot more sweat equity and more, uh, less financial. Um, you could launch an item for less than $3,000 if you did all the work and, you know, you bought the item and shipped it and whatnot. Um, 
the, the marketing to get an item off the ground by itself versus the acquisition, it's, it's, it is very difficult to get an item off the ground these days. Uh, it is much yes. easier to just continue riding uh, the Steam engine. But if you learn and understand that in the first two weeks, there's a honeymoon period and you try and push as many sales in the door, you can leapfrog some of that. But just keep in mind that any product that you launch from scratch guaranteed will be at a loss in the first 90 days, break even probably month three to six, and then the real profits start month seven plus. And so if you structure out any of your Excel sheets with that in mind and understand that you're going to have excess uh, marketing spend versus what's coming in the first 90 days, trying to break even month four to six, and then making money month seven plus, that's, that usually pans out pretty accurately. Okay. Um, whereas if you acquire a company, um, all bets are off the, you could be profitable day one based on the books, or you may acquire the company and they've got a list of 20 other products they haven't launched or gotten to yet. And then you are able to add, um, some finances or financial support in to go execute additional plans and strategy. Uh, if you do look at companies to acquire, I think one of the first or second questions you should ask them is. What things would you like to have done, but you haven't gotten to yet that maybe I could take your business and go do once I acquire you. And, you know, by then they should be under NDA and be willing to share. But basically um, what I would hope to see is, you know, here, you know, walk me through the last three, three product launches you did. How did they go and whatnot? Tell me the history there. What's the next three products you plan on launching and why haven't you got there yet? And what I would hope to hear is we just haven't had time. Uh, we've been running, you know, running ourselves into the ground on other fronts. That would be the expected answer. Um, yeah. Or we don't have the finances or whatever. Um, if they don't have the next three products ready to roll, um, then, then they, were, they checked out long ago is what that would tell me. Um, because every Amazon seller always, they, you know, they got a closet full of, of goods that they've, the requested samples on that they are like, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about that. It's just like constantly Excel sheets upon Google sheets, listing out products to go look at uh, profit analysis and uh, looking at the helium 10 Cerebro scores for how much uh, demand there is for the sector versus the number of competitors that are showing up and the average review counts and the, the net margins on selling an item at a certain rate. And what's the PPC cost? They, they, they should be all over that. Um, I usually recommend business owners to become experts on product dev as their main forte. Now, not everybody can do that. Um, but even if you acquire a business, that is an area where I would just become an expert in regardless. Because uh, <clears throat> product dev is a never ending task and it's not one I recommend outsourcing. The, the easiest thing to outsource is running ads. That is the easiest one. There's a dime a dozen vendors to do that part. Um, the catalog work, uh, I, very difficult to find that these days. Uh, not a lot of good uh, partners for there. I, I, obviously, we do that. Um, but, but the reason I'm trying, I'm just trying to set up like where you're going to find challenges and whatnot. Um, and, and design's easy to find, but the technical implication is, is not. So as you look at uh, businesses, I would look at, Obviously, you're going to look at their P&L. You're going to look at the EBITDA, figuring out like what they're worth, and you're going to try and figure that out. And we think we think that that's going to go up in the next year based on uh, people undervaluing Amazon businesses. And there's going to be there's there's currently an exodus of companies that are leaving the space because the complexity has gone up. So there's all these weird market forces going on right now. There's also a rush to go sell on Amazon and more new market entrants. It's kind of a combination of interesting factors. So, so understanding all that, and it's very easy to figure out why a company would want to sell right now. They're overwhelmed with complexity. Yeah. That's going to be the common trend that you're going to find, I think. So, so if you get that answer, that's, that's fine. So just try and figure out where, where are the complexities that they couldn't solve that maybe you can step in on. Yes. Um, and, and I, I've seen consistently that that's also possible. Um, you just might have to weed out a little bit more. Um, and the competition for them is going to be higher. So they're going to command a premium because um, yeah. if, if, if a good one comes across, they're going to have a quick offer. And so you just have to be watching. You have to subscribe to all those newsletters. You have to read them all. And then you have to immediately jump on them. 
I would get pre-qualified for a loan. I would, I would interview with the brokerages and say, Hey, here's, here's who I am. Here's what I'm looking for. And I'm ready for you. Um, acquire their checklist, listen to their podcasts, um, and, and ask them those questions so that they can understand, um, why you would be a good person to, to make that acquisition and, and they should pay attention to you and get you set up quicker than others. Uh, that is normal omni-channel friction. Yep. And I would say that you should allow Amazon to acquire customers from wherever they can. Um, should you build a website and diversify your portfolio? Absolutely. But I would make it an afterthought. I wouldn't make it phase one. I'd make it phase two or three. I have two monster competitors we do business with and they came <laughs> in here because, uh, and I, <laughs> And, and, and one of them was quite large and larger than Momster, by the way. And I, I convinced him to work with me despite it. And I was like, look, I know more and I will share all of my trade secrets with you. Okay. And I don't care about this business. So, so it's more, uh, that, that, that's an interesting question. It's more amorphous for me specifically. Yeah. Um, and we all ships rise together is the way I would look at it. Yeah. All right. but, but to be fair, some agencies do put protocols where they have non, non competes with, with each other. I chose not to, and it's worked out well for me for whatever reason. So all ships okay. rise together with that in mind. Um, so Jeff, it was great talking with you today. I'm going to send you a copy of the recording. It usually takes an hour and a half to, to compile. Um, make sure you download it today. Um, they do delete in a week. Um, yeah. I valued our coaching session today. I would, uh, I would go action a lot of the homework we talked about, maybe touch base with me in a month. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you need to do the next coaching call in 30 days, but, but touch base with me in some fashion. Just let me know where you're at, even if it's a two line email. Uh, and then once you have a business to look at, that's definitely when I would make sure I would schedule the next call. So we can go through a checklist and, and then you could use that checklist that we build and look at, and we go into the account and you'll know what to look for that way. When you do this discovery call two and three, it'll make sense. So my name is Stephen Pope. I'm the founder of my Amazon guy. Every single person who goes to myamazonguy.com and contacts us and fills out some information, I read every single one of those personally. And I will respond to them um, to help give you opportunities or options to help grow your sales on Amazon or solve a problem. So feel free to hit that subscribe button if you're not quite ready to hire us. Keep, keep watching, keep listening. We'll keep adding value wherever we can. We're always on the lookout to tell um, stories about you know, other Amazon sellers. So if you got a journey you wanna to talk to us about, we'd be happy to do that. Just send us an email to podcasts at myamazonguy.com.